Hello, V. Anton Sprawl here again to talk about how you can learn to think like a programmer. In this video, I'm going to walk through my solution for a problem I solved just for fun. I'll explain my decisions and show you where I made mistakes, and you'll see how I applied my problem solving techniques. Also, I want to start to show how we each have our own programming personality and how we can leverage our strengths and weaknesses. This is something I talk about in the last chapter of my book. So, here's the problem. This is a pyramid of holes, and all the holes but one have a golf tee or a peg in them. And the way this puzzle works is, you can jump one peg over another if there's an empty hole on the other side, and then remove the peg that you jumped. Kind of like checkers, or drafts, as those wacky Brits say. You keep jumping pegs in this way until you can't make any more moves, and you win if you end up with just one peg left. So, my challenge was to write a program to find the solution for me. I think lots of programmers have tried this over the years, but of course I wanted to write my own solution and from scratch. My first rule of programming is to always have a plan. Especially with a tricky program like this, I don't want to just dive in. I had a number of questions I needed to answer before I even thought about coding. I mean, the basic idea was clear enough. I was going to have the program try out all the possible combinations of moves until it found one that worked. But what about these questions? How do I represent the state of the board at any moment? And how do I find all the legal moves possible from any particular state of the board? In the first question, I decided that I would number the positions 0 through 14, like this. For each position, I just needed to know, does it currently hold a peg or not? My first thought was I could use an array of 15 Boolean values, so element 0 in the array would be true if there was a peg in position 0 on the board. But here's the thing. I'm thinking about generating all the possible moves, and this puts me in mind of similar programs I've written for artificial intelligence. If you're writing a program to play a human at chess or something like that, you'll have to do the same sort of thing I'm doing here, generate all the possible moves from the current state, and then all the possible moves from the state that results, and so on. Depending on how many moves are possible at each point, the number of states can be enormous, and the search becomes very slow. Well, in those artificial intelligence programs, what you often have to do is keep track of the states that you've already generated so that you can avoid going down the same path more than once. You see, in most games, there's lots of sequences of moves that can produce the same results. Now, if I want to do that on this puzzle, it occurs to me it would be nice to have a fast and simple way to store all the states I've already seen and be able to com quickly compare states to see if they are equal. So what I think I'm going to do is store a game state as a simple integer. The idea is that the binary representation of the number will indicate which positions have pegs. So, for example, if there are pegs remaining in positions 2, 6, and 14, those bit positions will be 1 and all others will be 0. The binary number will be as shown, which is a decimal 16,452. I can quickly store and look up simple integers using the unordered set class in the C++ standard library. Now, how to find legal moves. Basically, I need to look at every position, and if there's a peg in that position, I have to check each direction to see if there's a peg I can jump, which means there's a peg in the adjacent position in that direction, and then there has to be an empty hole on the other side but I need a simple way to do that. Well, here's the idea I came up with. There are six possible directions from each position. I call these Northwest, Northeast, West, East, Southwest, and Southeast. I made a constant array that shows for each position, the position that is in that direction, with minus one to indicate there is no position in that direction. This was actually the first part of the code I wrote. You'll notice that I spent some effort to line everything up nicely. Now, I wouldn't always do this for a constant array, but in this case, 
I was really worried about entering a wrong value here and ending up with a very subtle bug later. So I wanted to maximize the chance to get everything right and make something that would be easy to check. Next, I started writing some support code I knew I would need. Once my code reached a state with just one peg, it would need some way to display all the moves that it took to get there. So I needed a way to store a sequence of moves along with each board state. I created a struct, which in C++ is basically just a class, except we tend to use them for lightweight classes where we're more about grouping and naming data and not so much about information hiding. So my move class has members from, to, and capture. These will all be integers representing positions, indicating where a peg was, where it went to, and what peg was removed in the jump. Then I made a partial solution struct that holds a board state and a queue of my move struct. So this will hold a particular board state and all the moves it took to get there. Next, the hasPeg function is going to tell me whether a particular board state has a peg in a particular position. I do this using the C++ binary shift operator. I take a one and shift it uh, left by the position number, then binary and it to see if the result is positive. For example, suppose that this was our binary number and the position we're checking is six. So one left shifted six times is this. And when we and this with the state, we get this result. And because that's non-zero, there is a peg in position six. Next up is legal move. This function tells me if there is a legal move in a particular direction. So direction here is a number from zero to five. Zero is what I call the northwest position in my array and so on. The function first determines what the adjacent position is in that direction using my directions constant array that I created earlier. If that's negative one, there's no position there and we're done. If not, I use that same idea to find the position adjacent to the adjacent position in the same direction. Again, if there's no position there, we just return false. Otherwise, we make sure there's a peg in the current position and in the capture position, but it's empty in the landing position. If all that checks out, it's a legal move. Note that legal move has reference parameters for the capture position and landing position. So these values will get sent back to the caller. Now we get to the heart of the program. This function is given a particular state and generates all of what we would call the successor states. The program maintains uh, one queue of all the states it has reached to this point, uh, but not processed. And this function is going to add the new states it generates onto the back end of that queue. The outer loop runs through all 15 positions on the board. For each position, we look at all six directions. We make a call to is legal move. And for legal moves, we do some bitwise operations to clear the current position and the capture position and to put the peg in the landing position. Um, X or, that is exclusive or, is used to flip the bits. Now, found states is a set of integers that holds all the states I've found so far. Initially, I didn't have this in here. I mean, I planned all along to do this if I needed to, which is why I used integers for board states. But honestly, I wasn't sure it would be necessary. But it, it was, as I will explain later. So for each new state that results from one of the legal moves I have found from the current state, I first check to see if that state number is already in this set. If not, then I add it to the set and I copy the queue of moves from the current partial solution to the new partial solution, create a new move struct and add that to the move queue in the new partial solution. This is one of the mistakes I made originally. I somehow forgot to copy the queue of moves over from the current partial solution which meant that when my program actually found a solution, it would only output the last move in the chain, which was kind of cruel, really. Anyway, 
The new partial solution is then added to the queue of possible solutions. This function determines if a state is a solution state. In other words, is there just one peg left? Here's where I made another mistake, which is why you see this test is solution function below it. Because I was pretty sure I had a problem in the is solution function. You can see what I originally had for this line in the commented out line above it. I had count where I should have had one. I really don't know how that happened. What the code does is loop position from 0 to 14 and then use that to shift a one bit left and test that bit in the state using bitwise and, pretty much like we did in haspeg. Only in this case, we're trying each position and counting up the one bits. Down in my main program, you can see my third mistake, which is that I set the initial state wrong. At the beginning of this puzzle, the zero position is clear and all the others have pegs. Unfortunately, I used a 16-bit state when I wrote this. You can even see my original comment showing the binary number I was intending to create. In this case, though, I understand why I made the mistake. It's a classic off-by-one error. The number 15 is rolling around in my head. That's the number of positions on the board. But the first bit position is position 0. And so I went from position 0 to position 15 instead of going to position 14 to make 15 total positions. After that, I set up the initial state and partial solution and put that in the possible solutions queue. Then it's just a loop that pulls the front partial solution from the queue, checks to see if it's a solution, and if not, generates all the new partial solutions from that and sticks them at the end of the queue. So, like I said, I made three mistakes creating this program, which, you know, isn't bad for this amount of code. But I want to talk about what I call programmer personality. At this stage, I'm pretty confident both in my ability to write code with relatively few dumb mistakes, and I'm confident in my ability to track down bugs when I make them. When I was younger and less experienced, I would tend to make a lot more mistakes, and tracking down errors is a lot harder when you have lots of them to deal with at once. The point is, I wrote this program pretty much in one go before I started testing it. For other programmers, that would be the wrong approach. I mean, it would be the wrong approach for me if this program were much larger or if it were going to be used for some critical function in a business or something like that. You have to find the right approach for the programmer and the problem. Now let's talk performance. You know, in a previous video, I talk about performance and efficiency and why two solutions that look like they should have very different performance are actually quite similar. Well, here's a case where optimization makes a huge difference. As shown here with the code that makes sure I never generate the same state a second time, well, this program runs on my computer in about 800 milliseconds. Because of cutting off the duplicate states, I only generate a total of 3,016 states. Now, if I remove that and let the program generate all the possible states, it generates over a million of them, and the program takes four and a half minutes to run. And that's actually with me removing the call to display the solutions, otherwise it would be a lot longer. Because that's another thing. Although this program doesn't halt when it finds the first solution, with the duplicate state cut off, the program generates just four solutions. But because there are so many different ways, so many different permutations of reordering moves to get the same effect, there are actually 20,760 distinct solutions to this problem. And without the duplicate cutoff, the program will generate them all. So we have to be clear on the distinction between finding a solution to this peg puzzle and finding all of them. You know, my books, I talk about the power of analogy, of finding an idea in a solution for a different problem. Finding analogies can be a lot easier when you take the time to reflect and generalize on your solutions. In this case, the basic approach I use can be used in all kinds of problems if you can consider them in terms of states and then moves or actions. Having a function that generates successor states 
and a function that tests whether or not a state is the goal state, where you can use this kind of loop to solve that problem. And preventing the generation of duplicate states is often necessary in these sorts of problems. So that technique is also useful. Well, that's it for this episode. If you want to know more about thinking like a programmer, check out my books and other videos. And if you found this video helpful, please like, share, or subscribe. And as always, feel free to suggest topics for future videos. Thanks for watching.